All right, we are here to talk about sexual and asexual reproduction and the way that it works in various organisms across the spectrum. So, um, one thing we got to remember when we're talking about sexual and asexual reproduction is our cell theory. And the main thing we got to remember about cell theory is this bottom number, number three, right over here, because that talks about all cells come from pre-existing cells and that has to do with the reproduction of cells for an organism and that's telling you that every cell that's in an organism came from a pre-existing one that was there before something that happened when either the parents parents gametes got together or that organism just straight up divided through asexual reproduction so we're going to look at the way that those two things work the sexual and the asexual reproduction and asexual reproduction huge huge benefit of asexual reproduction is that it is a very fast way to make babies uh, when we make bacteria in the class later in the year you're going to see that we're going to make as about as many bacteria overnight as there are people in the world which is a pretty amazing feat and number and one of the big thing about those um offspring that come from asexual reproduction is that they are genetically identical to each other and the parent they came from now the weird thing is that the parent they came from doesn't really exist anymore so that parent just sort of divides into two separate cells and those two new cells which we call the daughter cells are going to be identical to each other and the parent they came from in prokaryotes this process is going to be called binary fission and in eukaryotes that is going to be called mitosis and at the end of this presentation we'll go into how binary fission works in the prokaryotes sexual reproduction is the result of a fusion of gametes. When we talk about gametes, we're talking about the male sperm and the female egg. And gametes come from a process in the eukaryotes called meiosis. Meiosis starts with a diploid cell that divides two times and ends up with a bunch of haploid cells, four haploid cells to be precise. And the crazy thing about those haploids is that they are genetically unique which causes some kind of genetic variation, which from a biologist's perspective, genetic variation is one of the most important things that an organism can have because there's a chance that offspring created through this genetic variation might be more fit for survival. And things that are more fit for survival tend to cause change over time, which is evolution, meaning that sexual reproduction is a strong, strong mechanism for the process of evolution that we'll be going over way later in the year. So biologists hear genetic variation, they always get a little crazy because that is kind of a big deal for them. Now, when we talk about cells in organisms, um, cells can be either somatic, and we're talking about eukaryotic organisms right now because eukaryotes are all going to be, or, um, well, sorry, except for the protists, are going to be multicellular. Um, somatic cells are the cells that aren't specialized for reproduction. So in my body, that'd be my skin cells, my tongue cells, my eye cells, my stomach cells, my spleen, my liver, my nerve cells, all of those are going to be somatic cells because they have nothing to do with the reproduction process. Um, somatic cells are what we call diploid. They're diploid because they have two sets of chromosomes. One set of chromosomes came from the male sperm, the other came from the female egg, and both of the, your parents. And when those two haploid cells got together, they created that diploid zygote, and the same DNA from that diploid zygote that got together with the sperm and the egg is in every cell inside your body, which is a pretty amazing feat when you really think about the trillions of cells that you have inside of you. We also have gametes. Gametes are the specialized sex cells that we've been talking a little bit about. Gametes are going to be haploid and genetically unique from each other. Um, gametes are going to be in the men, male's sperm and in female's eggs. And when the sperm and the egg fuse together, they create what's called a zygote. That process of the gametes fusing together is what we call fertilization. And that's kind of the basis behind sexual reproduction. Now, when we talk about chromosome number, um, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. In a haploid cell, we always say that there's one N chromosomes. So with humans having 23 chromosomes, one times 23 means there's 23 chromosomes in a gamete. With our somatic cells, which are diploid, we say that diploid cells are always going to be 2N. Since you have 23 pairs of chromosomes as a human, 2 times 23 is 46 chromosomes in every diploid cell. So if you ever see 1N or 2N, that's sort of what we're talking about, is whether you're haploid or diploid and how many total chromosomes that cell has. Um, sexually reproducing organisms have different kinds of life cycles, and we're going to go over these three different life cycles in a second here. If you look at this one, you see haplontic. 
that kind of sounds like haploid and that will kind of play a key role in identifying what's going on there and we also see diplontic which reminds me of diploid so just a couple key things that you should um, pay attention to as you are looking through this stuff here so in the haplontic organisms look over here at this little chart on the bottom left hand corner don't think of this as three quarters of your life as haploid, one quarter of your life as diploid for these organisms. That's not what this is trying to say at all. What this is trying to say is that a vast majority of the life cycle of a haplontic organism is going to be spent in a haploid stage. And the only time these organisms ever become diploid is after fertilization, when the male one end gamete mates, uh, fuses with a female one end gamete. Well, 1n plus 1n equals 2n, and that's your zygote right down here. As soon as a haplontic organism becomes a zygote, it automatically goes through meiosis and creates more gametes, and it goes back to that haploid life cycle, the haploid stage of its life. So all we're saying with a haplontic organism is that most of their time, they're going to be in the haploid stage. With alternation of generations, look at the chart here in the bottom right now. We have ha about half the time it's haploid, half the time it's a diploid. And a couple things to take note of. Gametophyte. Well, gametophyte kind of has a root gamete in it, and that's going to be on the haploid side of the life cycle. During the diploid side of the life cycle, we see something called a sporophyte. And that's kind of the big information I want you guys to get, is that um, organisms that have a sexual life cycle that's um, alternation of generations, it's about spend, splitting time between haploid and diploid life cycles. When it's in the haploid side, that's when you'll see gametophytes. When it's in the diploid side, that's when you'll see the sporophytes. On the diplontic organism, again, similar over here, a good majority of the life cycle is going to be diploid. And guess what? animals are going to be diplontic organisms, which means you and me are going to be diplontic organisms. And you think about yourself. The only time you were ever haploid was when you were a sperm or an egg. As soon as the sperm and the egg fused during fertilization, you became a diploid organism, and most of your life, a vast majority of your life cycle, you're going to be in that diploid phase. And that's all this chart is saying. So these three life cycles just sort of talk about where the organism's, organism is going to be spending most of their life cycle. Now, if we want to talk about asexual reproduction, just a quick review of what we said earlier. We said that binary fission is the asexual life cycle that happens in prokaryotes. Mitosis is the one that happens in eukaryotes. And specifically for eukaryotes, that's going to happen in somatic cells. So we're going to talk about the asexual reproduction of that. We'll talk about mitosis more in another presentation. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about binary fission, though, in the next two slides. Both of these processes, again, are going to produce genetically identical daughter cells. Those daughter cells are identical to each other and identical to the parent that they came from. And remember, that parent cell doesn't really exist anymore because it's sort of split between the two. Anytime we're talking about asexual reproduction, four basic steps are going to happen in order to get the ball rolling and move on from one parent cell to two daughter cells. The first thing is that cell is going to receive a reproductive signal, and that signal is going to tell the cell, hey, it's time to move out of your stage and go ahead and divide. The second thing that's going to happen is DNA is going to get copied. Think of DNA as the blueprints for a house. If you're going to make two daughter cells, you want to make sure each daughter cell has an exact copy of the DNA. So that DNA needs to copy so that both daughter cells get all the blueprints for the house. The third thing that's going to happen is that DNA is going to separate. So one half goes to one daughter cell, the other half goes to the other daughter cell. And the final thing that's going to go on in asexual reproduction is any enzymes, any organelles, any plasma, any plasma membrane, any of these extra parts are going to get built up and divided between the two new cells. It, it's not always equal, but it, um, through the process, you kind of make sure that each new daughter cell has what they need to survive and get moving. Let's look at binary fission. Binary fission is preferred reproductive method for prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are single-celled organisms that don't have a nucleus or of any other membrane-bound organelles. One other big difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote is the shape of the DNA. Prokaryotic DNA is usually going to be circular, and since there's no nucleus, prokaryotic DNA just sort of hangs out in an area inside this inside the site is all of that prokaryote. Um, in an area called the nucleoid. Well, that uh, once it gets the signal to divide, that it's going to get the signal, then the DNA has to copy. When prokaryotic DNA um, copies itself and 
eukaryotic DNA has ORIs also, and ORI is formed. ORI is short for origin of replication, and that's going to be the start of the DNA um, replication process. Now, if you remember from DNA, DNA has a backbone that's made up of uh, ribose sugar, uh, deoxyribose sugar and a phosphate head. And that's going to be attached to a nitrogenous base. And there's going to be two strands of that with the bases pointed towards each other and the sugar phosphate backbone on the outside. And what the ORI causes a split of those bases that are attached to each other. And hopefully you remember adenine is one of the bases and that base is always going to pair with thymine. Guanine is another base that always pairs with cytosine. So once those bases separate, other bases that are within the cytosol fill in those open spots until the DNA circle of DNA in the bat in the prokaryote is completely um, copied all the way around. Then we got two copies. After the signal's been taken care of, the DNA's been copied, then that DNA is going to move to opposite sides of the cell. And you can sort of see that in this third picture here. You got a blue copy going to the left, you got a purple copy going to the right. And look what's happening right here. We're seeing a little pinching going on right here. And that's because there's a contractile ring that is sort of break it's not breaking it but it's pinching the plasma membrane cell wall that prokaryote together creating what's called a cleavage furrow which is that little gap right there and eventually it's gonna break and pinch into two separate daughter cells crazy thing about this this daughter cell on the left has the exact same copy of dna as this one on the right and because of that those two cells can do everything they're supposed to do in their life cycle so we've gone over asexual and sexual reproduction in this slideshow. We've also talked about benefits of both of those and different sexual life cycles and how prokaryotes go through binary fission. In the next series, we're going to look at mitosis and meiosis and see how eukaryotes are doing some other stuff. Hope you enjoyed. Have a good evening.